about Bill and Kathy Swan. Their friends couldn't believe it, their neighbors couldn't believe it, their families certainly could not believe it. But that didn't matter. The state of Washington believed it, and that's all that mattered. Bill Swan is in prison. His wife, Kathy, is in prison. Both have been convicted of the violent sexual abuse of their three-year-old daughter and her three-year-old friend. Bill Swan is an engineer. His wife, Kathy, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate in languages. They have not seen their daughter for six years, and if the state has its way, we'll never see her again. Kathy remembers their last day as a family, the day she went to pick up her child at a daycare center and was met by a policeman. He said, um, she's been taken into custody. There have been allegations of abuse. And I said, well, has the daycare done something to her? Did, did something happen at the daycare? What's this all about? And he said, uh, well, um, no, nothing happened at the daycare. You and your husband are the chief suspects. They never bothered to come out and talk to us, to talk to family, to talk to anybody around us to try to find out what was going on. They grabbed our child and accused us right from the start. It began with Lisa Conradi, who had just been hired as a teacher at this daycare center in a Seattle suburb. Both children had been coming here for two years. Cindy Bratvold, the owner, hired Ms. Conradi. Did she claim to have any qualifications? She was a certified preschool teacher, as far as I knew at that time. Did she give you a, a license or a degree or anything like that? I don't even remember. Lisa Conradi had no certification whatsoever, not even a high school diploma. On her first full day on the job, less than an hour with the children, she said the swan child told her of continuing genital and oral rape at home by both of her parents. She said her friend, another child at the daycare center, was there when it happened. I was so overwhelmed by what she told me that I needed to give somebody else the information. And so? So I called Children's Protective Service. On their first visit to the center, two Child Protective Service social workers couldn't get anything out of the child and left, but encouraged Cindy Bratvolt to question the other little girl in their absence. Ms. Bratvolt had no experience at all in investigating child abuse. I asked her, what um, do you, when you go to Kathy Swan's house to play, what kind of games do you play? And she said, we play. And then she named off the exact same things that the Swan child said. Cindy Bratvold said the other child also told of oral and genital sex performed by Kathy and Bill Swan, including acts with candles and marbles. We had no marbles in our home. Birthday candles. Big ones, huge numbers. We never used the small ones because those things are easily swallowed. We, you know, when we had a we, when we had a birthday cake, we had the huge, big number candle in the middle of the birthday cake. We were I was collecting those in a box for her. When we persisted with questions to Cindy Bratvold about how she and Conradi gathered the information that sent the Swans to prison, she exploded. Yeah, this is ridiculous. I'm not well, either. what's the problem? You know what? Well, what's the I problem? I was guaranteed by Gail that I would be portrayed the way I want. No, nobody's portrayed the way they want. People are portrayed the way they are. The reason I am here is for a little girl. A little girl stated, and I heard her words, that she was screwed by her parents, that they did sick, sick things to her. Cindy Bratvold told those sick, sick things to the Child Protective Service, and a social worker returned to the center to talk to both of the little girls. The social worker was unable to get any answers from the children, and so once again, she asked Cindy Bratvold, who had no experience at all, to help with the questions. Dr. John Ewell is a forensic psychologist who studies interviewing techniques in child abuse cases. The daycare workers were uh, untrained, knew nothing about, uh, or very little at least, about child sexual abuse, and as far as I could gather, nothing about investigative interviewing. And yet, apparently, the social worker gave over the interview task to them, and uh, 
This means to me that the interview was not proceeding well and uh, engaging the assistance of even less trained people than yourself to try and proceed with an investigative interview is just a fundamental mistake. The social worker refuses to discuss the case. Frank Mendezabel, a PR man for the agency, speaks for her. The swan child corroborated the, test of the, the, the answers to the questions that the first little girl made. And then subsequently, the swan child did make some admissions. Uh, how did she corroborate it? How did the three she nodded yes. She said yes to questions. But you don't think there's a predisposition for a child to say yes to questions put by a wonderfully friendly adult? Not necessarily. I don't think there's a predisposition of children to lie. I think that, there's a, that children generally tell the truth. The two children were called before a judge who would decide if they were competent to testify. The swan child remained utterly silent. The other child had a vivid imagination, told the judge she'd been in court 40 times before. When she was asked the color of her blue dress, she said blue. The judge said, if I tell you that all long dresses are pink, and the child responded, well, it's blue, sort of, but it's pink. The judge ruled both children incompetent to testify, so the jury heard the girls' stories through the social worker and the daycare workers. There are two possibilities here, at least, with the use of leading and suggestive questions, and one of them is that the child can incorporate that information into his or her memory, in quotes, and it can become a part of their version of an event, even though the event didn't happen. We hired Dr. Ewell to make a detailed examination of the hundreds of pages of trial testimony. We were not able to give him transcripts of the interviews with the children because none were ever made. The second possibility is that the child has answered these questions as best he or she can, and the questions are um, not understood by the child, and the answers are misinterpreted. Maybe the child wasn't even reporting sexual abuse. But if somebody's looking for it, they might find it nonetheless. What the children said or was reported that they said was enough to convince the Child Protective Service that the Swan child and her friend had been violently abused. The Swan child was taken away and placed in foster care. Her friend was sent home. Three weeks later, Kathy and Bill Swan were arrested. And what about the other child's mother? At first, she was furious with the swans, but a gynecological examination of her daughter showed no sign of abuse, and as time went on, she began to have doubts. She does not want her face on television to spare her daughter any further involvement, but she did speak to us by phone. And I firmly believe that everything that was alleged was totally manufactured in the mind, first of all, of um, the daycare worker mm -hmm. that supposedly discovered all this, and then from there, because of the attention drawn to it, was, uh, you know, just really blown up. And um, I really believe that, that it was something of a witch hunt. Do you think categorically the swans are innocent? Yes, I do. Of everything that they have been charged with. I don't think that they ever did anything to their daughter. I know that they never did anything to my daughter. And... That's firmly what I believe. Because, you know, Though her child had an immediate exam for sex abuse, the state did not have an expert examine the swan child. In a perfect world, it would be great if you could get a pediatrician who was an expert to come out and do the examination. No, there's a trauma center 20 minutes from where you were, where you could have taken the child. That's, there is not, it is not standard procedure to conduct a physical examination of sex abuse victims in this state or in most states. That's just not true. It is standard procedure in Washington state and in most other states to have the child examined when serious abuse is suspected. So you never sent any expert on child abuse, or, or physician, gynecologist, pediatrician to examine the child? No. The child was examined by a nurse, Ted Ritter, who'd never before done an exam for sex abuse on a small child. At the trial, the prosecution used his notes to try and prove sexual abuse. Those notes implied that the swan child was no longer a virgin, that no hymen was present. But no full-scale gynecological examination was ever made until five years after the alleged abuse, when a relative of the swans managed to get Dr. Richard Soderstrom to examine the child. 
And in this particular um, circumstance, I was able to document that not only was there a normal hymen, but the opening was normal as well. Surely it's very difficult to, to make a positive statement one way or the other <clears throat> after so much, so much time has elapsed. Well, it is, except that um, from an anatomical sense, hymens just don't uh, come back. They don't grow back. The Swans asked for a new trial based on the findings of Dr. Soderstrom. The state courts turned them down. They're now trying to get a federal court to order a new trial based both on the medical findings and new information about the daycare worker. It was not until after the Swans were convicted that details about Lisa Conradi began to emerge. She has a history of making bizarre allegations. She told freelance reporter Dean Huber she'd made at least 20 earlier accusations of child abuse. She said she'd been a drug addict, an alcoholic, and that she'd been abused since the age of five by hundreds of men. Lisa Conradi refuses to talk to us. But shortly after the trial, she made this audio recording. The only thing I thought of myself as was a body to be used for sex, which was used regularly, daily. And I'm telling you, there are more perverts out there than there are normal people. Or maybe it was just um, me, I don't know. <laughs> I did not know until I was 22 years old that there was such a thing as adults not having sex with children. I don't like to see kids abused, and when I see it, I turn them down. When, when my kids were abused, I went through our neighborhood and every other house had abuse in it, and it was just sickening. Exactly what all was known about Ms. Conradi, I don't know. I can't answer. Becky Rowe is the chief prosecutor in the King County Special Assault Unit. Special Assault. The agency that brought charges against the Swans. The unit, because of the aggressive nature of Ms. Rowe, has come to be known as the Women's Vengeance Brigade. Under Ms. Rowe's leadership, the number of cases of abuse against women and children filed in the county has nearly doubled. You find that uh, someone with, the, with these, <clears throat> this particular history and virtually no qualifications is in a daycare center, and within an hour of her new job, she finds gross sexual abuse. Doesn't send up any red flags for you? No. Really? Really. I don't know what, you know, what her prior, for instance, alcohol and drug addiction, which was not an issue for her at this particular time, I don't know what that has to do with anything. That's just, you know, run-of-the-mill character assassination. Well, it's hardly run-of-the-mill, given the seriousness of the charges and the fuse lit by this woman. It's hardly run-of-the-mill, would you say? I would say that it has no relationship whatsoever or to claims she was abused four or five hundred times by every man she ever met. Well, I again I think they're taking liberties the with the mill. transcript of the tape. In fact, Lisa Conradi said it was three or four hundred men, quote, damn near everybody that came near me, unquote. And there's no doubt in your mind the swans are guilty of everything these children and the daycare people said they did. I have utmost confidence in the verdict of this jury and in the review of this case by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court twice over. That wasn't the question. Well, that's my answer. They offered you a plea bargain. Yes, they did. You'd serve nine months, take some therapy, get out, have your daughter back, and you would have been a family again now. You'd have been out, both of you. Mm-hmm. Do you now, given what's happened, do you regret you didn't take that no, offer? No, not at all. Why not? Because a plea bargain is a way for a guilty person to get off serving the full sentence that they deserve if indeed they're guilty. I'm not guilty. I'm not bargaining. It's too late for a plea bargain. It may be too late for anything. The state plans to put their child up for adoption.